Welcome to Energy Talks, a regular podcast series with expert discussions on power system testing topics. My name is Scott Williams from the podcast team at Omicron, and I will be your host. Hello, everyone. In our episode number 30 about fire mitigation at electrical utilities, our guest experts described how the use of line control devices can help technicians respond quickly to down power lines and to avoid sparks in dry, windy conditions. In this episode, we will expand the discussion to address another aspect related to fire mitigation. As the typical fire season of just a few months has grown longer in many parts of the world to cover most of the year, so-called fire weather forecasting, supported with reliable real-time data, is also helping electrical utilities effectively plan their response before wildfires start and spread. My guest experts in this episode are based in the United States, and they work together to implement essential fire weather forecasting tools to stay ahead of wildfires and their disastrous consequences. Without further delay, I am pleased to introduce René Vandeweg. René is the Vice President of Weather Operations at DTN, a global data, analytics, and technology company. René is based in Lincoln, Nebraska. Before joining DTN, René was the director of the Broadcast Meteorology Program at Mississippi State University. He was also a broadcast meteorologist who covered Hurricane Katrina back in 2005. Hello, René. Welcome to Energy Talks. It is great to be here, Scott. Also with me is Denton McGregor. Denton is the Senior Reliability Center Manager at Black Hills Energy, which supplies natural gas and electrical power to customers in the U.S. states of Colorado, Wyoming, South Dakota, and Montana. Denton is based in Rapid City, South Dakota. Hello, Denton. Thank you for joining us at Energy Talks. Yeah, thanks for having me, Scott. Uh, Appreciate the invitation to speak on the show today. It is a pleasure to have you both here for this discussion. Rene, could you please describe what DTN does and how it is involved with the electrical power industry? Yeah, DTN is a data analytics software company that provides insights to all kinds of industries, including the utilities. And really, when we work with organizations, we're working with companies that value weather as as really one of the top, say, two or three risks to the business. So when I say risk, that could mean risk involving safety of workers. It could be where weather disrupts the business in a way that adds costs or decreases revenue to a business, and even things like brand reputation. Sometimes you see on social media, for example, a cruise ship ends up floating into a bad storm and the the participants start tweeting out, hey, we, you know, we floated into a hurricane. That's not a very good image for the company. Mm-hmm. And so when we work with organizations, we are identifying uh, various ways that weather generates risk for their business. And our job is to uh, create avenues to minimize that risk uh, by providing insights and information that can really help mitigate that. So in the electric utilities, we're we're looking at a few different avenues. One of the main ones is power outages and trying to predict where power outages may occur as a result of weather, be that thunderstorms, high winds, wildfires, hurricanes, and helping the utility to plan ahead of that occurrence so that they can uh, make critical decisions to either reduce the amount of outages or get power restored as quickly as possible. We work on load forecasting. So, you know, critical things like temperature determines how much electricity or gas may be used to heat or cool buildings, and that really drives demand. And so we're providing insights on ensuring that utilities have the, the correct amount of power and, and pricing power in order to supply the right amount of energy to their customers. So we work with utilities in a lot of different ways, uh, but weather being the the key factor in that, and, and then in any industry that we serve, you know, weather is one of those top tier risk factors or variables that dictate the outcome for the business. Why should electrical utilities be concerned about the weather in general? 
It's just so disruptive. And the great thing about weather here in the past decade or even, you know, the past 20 years and certainly going in, into the future is weather is becoming, number one, more predictable. And there's jokes that get made still to this day about meteorology and the fact that well, the forecast is never right. We have all kinds of data that proves that's wrong. And so, uh, so number one, a utility should be confident in the fact that when you're utilizing weather information, there's a, a high degree of accuracy that goes into it. But what's really exciting to me is the advancement of other technologies that we can pair together with our rich weather data sets to start to drive more insight driven or outcome driven um, intelligence for, for utility. So whether it be uh, power outage predictions, pretty neat. We can go back and look at multiple years of power outages and marry that together with our weather history to determine what weather conditions could cause power outages. Mm -hmm. and, and by taking that advanced technology, we can now create predictions of the same type of data to say, we are now seeing a weather scenario where we're predicting that power outages will occur. And so that generates a ton of value for the utilities in their planning process and planning as far out as, you know, several months in advance or days in advance to either pre-stage crews. Um, and I'm sure Denton will get into some scenarios where uh, you're making critical decisions on assets that you might want to harden, um, you know, really taking these weather insights and making smart decisions at the utility level to lessen the impact of weather and or uh, be able to respond when weather does cause those disruptions. Okay. How does weather play a role in wildfire risk for electrical utilities around the world? Well, unfortunately, and we find this, when you're a meteorologist, you learn pretty quickly that weather, while I think weather is really cool, it is the leading cause for disaster in many cases, and, and wildfire is no different. So wildfires generally will develop as a result of some weather conditions that become favorable. So we look at information like wind speeds, wind gusts, how strong the wind is going to uh, potentially help spread fire. Wind is also a contributor to drying the air out. So we talk about mm -hmm. relative humidity. Uh, so the windier it gets, the air mixes up and the uh, conditions can become more favorable uh, for the generation of wildfires, but also the spread of wildfires. There's also other phenomena such as dry thunderstorms, which sounds contradictory, but certainly as you get into the western half of the United States, there's a lot of, in the summertime, thunderstorms that form, but the air towards the ground is so dry that the rain doesn't get to the ground, but you still develop lightning strikes. And so when a utility is looking at their liability or and or the potential that wildfire could uh, damage assets or even be created by certain assets, weather conditions can give us some insight into what is the likelihood for wildfire to develop mm -hmm. uh, where, and, and we can start to get down to a really localized level and start to even look at potentially individual assets or regions of assets that have a higher risk of generating uh, sparks and fire. Uh, and therefore, the weather is is really kind of the determining factor in when are conditions favorable to generate wildfires and then allow them to spread. Okay. Rennie, what is meant by the term fire weather? It's generally a set of conditions that are more paramount or more favorable for creating weather conditions. So a lot of times, as I mentioned, it's uh, number one, is there going to be spark potential due to weather? So if you have dry lightning strikes or just lightning in general, we look at wind of, of certain strength, direction matters in the case of spread. We're looking at temperature and moisture values in the atmosphere. But that not only is it the weather conditions for the fire itself, but it's also the underlying landscape. So if we have a prolonged period of dry weather, then the fuels that generate fire, maybe it's uh, you know pine needles or leaves, grasses that become very dry, weather helps sort of dictate 
how likely those are to become fire and, and spreadable. And so we classify that bundling of conditions as fire weather. So where weather conditions become most favorable for generating fires. What again are the fire weather factors or data points that need to be monitored to predict wildfire risk or deal with actual wildfire events? Yeah, so I think the two real major ones are relative humidity and wind. So mm -hmm. how dry is the air and how dry is the fuels for fire? And then the wind is really critical in determining where the fire could spread quickly based on the direction the wind is going and, and how fast. But it's also important to look at the temperature that we have expected as well as the potential for items like lightning to develop. Could there be any heavy rain? And we, we also look at winter weather conditions too. Uh, when you have ice that accretes on lines, it can create galloping and potential sparking. Sure. Um, so even though, even though we kind of think of wildfire as, as hot season, we're learning that wildfires can really occur any time of the year. Interesting. Randy, thank you for this background. Denton, could you please describe Black Hills Energy? How large is its service area, and how many customers does it supply with electrical power? Sure. So Black Hills Energy is a natural gas and electric utility. Um, we're headquartered out of Rapid City, South Dakota. Mm -hmm. currently serve about 1.3 million customers across eight different states here in the Midwest. So we're a little bit smaller electric utility in that we serve about 218,000 customers, and that's throughout South Dakota, Montana, Wyoming, and as far south as Colorado. So although we're a little bit smaller electric utility, um, our service territory spans about 500 miles from our northern to our southernmost boundary. So there's quite a lot of diversity throughout our service territory. I would say so. What are your responsibilities as Senior Reliability Center Manager at Black Hills Energy? So me and my team are responsible for several different things, um, quite a few different aspects of the electric utility. Some of those include outage response, outage coordination, system operator training, NERC compliance and updating our real-time SCADA system. But uh, if I had to summarize it, I'd say my team is responsible for the safe and reliable operation of the transmission and di distribution system assets that Black Hills Energy owns and operates. How has Black Hills Energy dealt with wildfire risk in the past? What have been your primary challenges? You know, years ago, we used to do things, I think as kind of Rennie alluded to, a little more seasonally based. You know, during hot and dry years, we would put certain circuits on non-reclose for maybe weeks or a month at a time until conditions improved. Uh, most of our actions, though, were based on kind of historical knowledge from those who knew the area. Mm -hmm. um, about seven years ago, we began basing our wildfire risk on more publicly available fire weather forecast information. However, we still relied on the system operators or somebody within the team to go out and check websites like the Rocky Mountain Area Coordination Center. And we had to do this on a, ba on a daily basis. And then we used that information to determine our risk posture and what mitigating actions we would take on any given day. Now, the downfall of websites like what we were using is sometimes they were only being updated during the primary fire season. So during winter months and spring months, we would have to use other public websites to find, you know, good or reliable fire weather forecast information that made things, you know, a little more inconsistent than what we would like. And, and in a sense, what we we're trying to do is turn our system operators into pseudo fire weather meteorologists and risk experts. Mm -hmm. So the primary challenge we had was really getting good, reliable fire weather risk information for each of our service territories delivered on a daily basis, and then having a method to apply those mitigating actions to all the different regions we have based on the fire weather risk. And that's something that we, we, we tried to manage for years, but it was uh, very difficult to manage through. In addition to the risks to the personal safety of your customers, their homes and businesses. What ways do wildfires impact the power infrastructure at Black Hills Energy? So this is a little bit of a, 
of a challenge at times because we have to do our best to strike a balance between monitoring the impacts of a wildfire on our electrical system infrastructure and yet keeping the lights on as reliable as we can because there's still a lot of individuals out there who are responding to wildfires, they're evacuating, they're fighting the fires. And when our electrical infrastructure is susceptible to wildfires, no different than the customers we're serving, mm -hmm. we have to take mitigating actions to avoid unnecessary risk where we could potentially create a wildfire while ensuring you know, we have an appropriate response to help emergency responders battle the wildfires that are currently in effect. Okay. What specific changes have you noticed in your service region in terms of wildfire risk? In terms of changes, I think we're much more proactive than we used to be. You know, we only used to look at things that would affect things really as it relates to our current day operations. Mm -hmm. Now we have the ability to plan for events that are three to five days out. Um, in addition to that, we've come up with methods to assist us in determining what our highest risk circuits are based on different data that we have available. Some of this is publicly available data, and some of it is um, leveraged on our, on our assets that we have from our GIS system and our outage management system. Mm -hmm. And then we've been able to take this and weight the data and come up with a ranking system that allows us to prioritize uh, risk based on the circuits that we have that serve our service territory. Okay. What made Black Hills Energy decide to do more in terms of wildfire prediction and risk mitigation? So I think when you look at the electric utility industry today and you see how devastating the impacts of wildfires can be, not just to customers, but utilities as well. Mm -hmm. I think we've learned a lot by monitoring those situations. And it's become quite obvious to us that we need to do our best to mitigate the risks for our customers and our communities. So in terms of wildfire risk mitigation, it's something we've determined it just needs to be a focus if we're gonna remain committed to delivering safe and reliable electric service to our customers. Very good. Thank you, Denton. Rennie, with the increasing intensity and frequency of wildfires, what weather prediction tools are available to electrical utilities to help prevent and mitigate wildfire risks? Denton has actually been a huge, huge help to DTN in this regard of helping us understand some of these new challenges. And to kind of add on to his last answer here, it's become a board level discussion at most utilities, especially in the Western US, you know, so not just an operational challenge, but even the board of directors of these utilities understand that wildfire is a critical component. So what we've done is really try to innovate. Um, as I mentioned previously, the weather forecasting is getting to become very good, but now we've started to pair together asset level information, uh, wildfire conditions, understand the topography and, and what makes up the landscape and blend that together with the weather data to create risk indexes where ultimately we're starting the level of risk of wildfire uh, production and spread on a scale. And, and we find that these numerical scales are kind of more easy to consume than a lot of words. So for example, we'll, we'll provide a, a daily an, an update that looks at a, a pretty small geographic area, a regional area that says, you know, in this particular geography, your risk index is somewhere between one and four, four being very severe, one being relatively low. And that allows us to start to combine uh, the weather conditions, the fire risk conditions, and start to pinpoint with a lot of accuracy where there's a likelihood for weather risk, or excuse me, wildfire risk mm -hmm. uh, by doing so, and doing so five days out in the future, as Denton mentioned, that allows the planning to really ramp up as opposed to, in some cases, historically being very reactionary. You know, a wildfire begins, now what do we do? We're starting to get ahead of that. Hey, there's a potential for new wildfires to form and spread, um, and now we can start to make critical decisions in that way. Okay, so Rennie, how does fire weather forecasting work and how is artificial intelligence or machine learning used to make it most effective? Yeah, it's the 
advent and usage and the availability of artificial intelligence and machine learning is critical to all aspects of impact-based weather forecasting and wildfires no different. Mm -hmm. um, ultimately, what this allows us to do is to look at historical conditions where fires formed and spread and build a profile and an algorithm that ultimately says, here are the conditions that are most favorable for wildfire. And then as we take our, our global weather forecasting and start to produce that into the future, and you start to look at that algorithm and say, hey, this is a condition that's really favorable for wildfire production by looking at the conditions we've talked about, the temperature, the humidity, wind speed, wind direction, lightning production, start to really assess here are the conditions that are most favorable for the next five days for weather and really get down to that hyper-local pinpoint level of saying it's not just good wildfire conditions across all of Colorado, for example, but really here near Pueblo or along the Front Range, wherever it might be, uh, to start to detail and um, create fire-specific weather forecasts uh, that are usable, consumable, and as a result, really aid in making strong decisions to help mitigate those risks. How does DTN provide electrical utilities with on-time weather intelligence for effective outage prediction and resource allocation? Yeah, the outage prediction space is neat. So we, we run essentially uh, with the utilities that we work with a, a 10-year historical model that looks at all of the previous outages that occurred and we we pair those up with the weather conditions to build that model going forward we work with the utility to create small regions of you know maybe workforce planning or however they want to distribute their districts and so we provide both visual and text based information that suggests Here's where we think that outages may occur within your service territory in these individual regions or districts. What the utilities utilize that for is a lot of times it's uh, one of the most impactful areas is based on mutual assistance planning. So especially, say, in the northeast U.S. where utilities are bringing in outside resources to help you know, rebuild the grid after an impactful weather event, Mm -hmm. uh, the, the utilities we talked with have mentioned that they struggle with optimizing that, you know, that bidding process and that acquisition of talent to bring in. So we've looked at multiple angles. We don't want to bring in too much mutual assistance and you're kind of overpaying and really not getting the maximum benefit. But at the same time, it's a really bad position to be in to not have enough resources to restore power. Uh, in certain parts of the country, that's a highly regulated area where if power is not restored in a certain amount of time, the utility faces pretty significant fines. Mm -hmm. And so not only are we optimizing the spend on uh, utility re resources to get the power back as fast as possible, but we're also mitigating a uh, potential fine risk from the regulators in saying, hey, you know, you didn't get the power restored in some places for 120 hours. Here's your penalty. Uh, we're really help mitigating that risk as well. So the power outage prediction is becoming very resourceful and valuable tool for utilities to reduce overspending or making sure you have the right amount of optimized resources while at the same time making sure your customers are happy by getting power restored as quickly as possible and making the regulators happy by uh, you know not having the power out for too long. Sure. Rene, could you please describe what is meant by a risk planning index and how is it the next step in wildfire risk mitigation? Yeah, De Denton, as I mentioned, was so helpful for to, to DTN in helping us develop this. We've done some uh, sort of risk indexing uh, for some other variables in the past for, for general power outages. But in wildfire, uh, we found this to be kind of the next step of maturity for operational intelligence where no longer are we just giving, call it like a binary, hey, high fire danger or no fire danger. We started to create multiple levels of risk and confidence in 
what we think could occur for the next five days. So we've generated a scale that's ranked one through four. Uh, one is a low probability of wildfire. Four is a severe probability of wildfire. And every day we forecast based on the individual individual variables that exist in a fire forecast and then combine that to create a wildfire index. Uh, so every day Denton can receive a, an index that basically says, hey, in your region in southern Colorado, today is a level three for wildfire. And the great thing is when we work with utilities, number one, we as DTN, we want to have an understanding of the actions that take place when these indices are met. So mm -hmm. uh, just because we issue a three is great the action that needs to be taken once you issue that forecast is really the important part. The other great thing is we have a team of meteorologists that specialize in these various threats, such as wildfire or hurricanes or severe weather, and they're available too for consultation on the forecast. There are times where we are exceptionally confident in a forecast. Mm -hmm. and there are other times where the confidence is low because there are variables at play that could uh, create outcomes. And so we know not everything is a, a black or white scenario. And we like to talk through the gray to make sure that our customers like Denton have, you know, the most information available to them to make these critical decisions. And, and really, I think what we've done is take, and I, I, I appreciate the comment Denton of, you know, we were asking our team to become pseudo meteorologists or wildfire analysts. That's, that's what DTN can be. Mm -hmm. And it's what we like to do with our customers, provide that expertise that uh, takes some of the guesswork out of it and can kind of create a single you know, source of, of trust and truth to make those critical decisions. Rene, do you have any examples of how electrical utilities around the world are successfully using weather intelligence to prepare for and mitigate wildfire risk? Well, Black Hills really is one of my favorite examples. So when we work with our various industries and and so we support other industries like shipping and aviation and other industries that have weather as a threat mm -hmm. and what what we've created is this concept we call it a weather maturity curve where most businesses will start out at taking basic weather information and over time their maturity on understanding the threat of weather and how it impacts their business grows and as a result, that pushes us to become more innovative and provide a solution to match that as they go. And so, you know, Black Hills, it's been awesome to watch their development and, and they've worked really closely with us. And I can't thank the organization enough in saying, look, these are the challenges we're facing. What we need to do is start deploying and get a forward look. We, we would really love to get three to five days out and start to really get a better handle and not just seasonally, but all year long. And so uh, I think we've worked very well in concert together to develop not only the tools to assess the risk, but then the plans to take once those risks are, are kind of met or imminent. And so we, we do that with a lot of our utility organizations, depending on what their primary threats are. Mm -hmm. Not all utilities have a real wild fire threat, but maybe they have ice storms or hurricanes or derechos. But no matter what that that threat is, in this case, wildfire, uh, our job is to look at the weather conditions and predict the impact of the potential uh, hazard that's coming. And then the utility can can really activate their plans to mitigate that risk as good as possible. And my my sincere kudos to Black Hills for recognizing that, developing new plans, and, and taking advantage of some of the innovation that's out there to really mitigate their risk. And, and their customers should feel great. For the record, I am a Black Hills gas customer. Uh, mm -hmm. so, so it makes me feel good that, you know, that my own utility is, is taking these steps you know, in order to, to try and keep service as reliable as possible. Thank you, Rennie. Well, Denton, let's hear how this has all worked for you and Black Hills Energy. Black Hills Energy currently is using fire weather forecasting to be more responsive in your service area. Could you describe how? Sure. Um, as it relates to fire weather forecasting, you know, I would say we're 
much better at understanding wildfire risk than we were five years ago. Mm -hmm. What we've done is establish regions with similar vegetation types that, and try to align those with the National Weather Service fire weather zones. Um, So within those regions, you know, kind of as Rennie mentioned, we get a risk grading index of one through four that relates to wildfire risk. And what we do is adjust our operations or mitigating activities based on the risk rating for that day, as well as what the forecast is. So we currently receive a five-day forecast with a risk rating along with a six to 10-day weather outlook. Mm -hmm. And what that does is that provides our teams an opportunity to plan for short-term work activities. Um, This kind of additional insight helps us and our team to determine if there's an event that's going to be short in duration and maybe only require some minor system changes or operational changes that uh, will take place maybe just during a couple hours during, you know, today, or if it's going to be a long-term event and we're going to need to take some more aggressive measures that may, inter- you know, may, may include turning uh, high-risk circuits to non-reclose, postponing work until risk is reduced, mm-hmm. or even requiring uh, line patrols on circuits that have outages, um, things of that nature. Okay. How did Black Hills Energy go about establishing a risk planning index for wildfire mitigation, and how does it work? So this is a little tough to explain over the phone, but I'll do my best, you know, to paint a (laughs) picture here. You know, Rennie kind of introduced some of this earlier on, but, you know, what the angle is that, that we kind of took is we started by reviewing the criteria that make up a red flag warning for our areas. Mm-hmm. Um, so let's say we have a humidity level less than 15% and a wind speed greater than 25 mile an hour. And those are some of the criteria on that the National Weather Service used to declare a red flag warning. Well, we then had consultants run some different fuel models uh, based on our vegetation makeup for each of the regions that we're considering. and we had them determine how many acres burn equate to a red flag warning. And then we had them run similar fuel models at higher wind speeds and higher humidity levels because we feel that the utility may have a higher risk, even if there isn't a red flag warning in effect, because at the higher wind speeds, that's when we run into things like uh, Rennie mentioned earlier, you know, lines galloping, things sparking, Um, vegetation that can make contact with the lines or blow through the lines. So there are a lot of other variables at a higher wind speed that add additional risk. Um, And then in addition to that, there's, you know, the burn index, you know, how cured are the fuels out there. Um, And we took all this into account, ran it at different um, humidity levels. And so, for example, let's say we have cured grass, uh, moderate humidity levels and wind speeds of 40 plus miles an hour. Well, the utility, we maybe have a higher concern on a day like that, even though it doesn't meet the criteria for a red flag warning. Mm-hmm. And D- DTN helped us align all of these different levels with a risk rating. So we understand even if there's not a red flag warning in effect, what the utility risk is on that given day. Okay. Black Hills Energy has a large service area. How do you manage fire weather intelligence at the local level for deploying response teams? So we set up our system to receive the energy event index every morning at 6 a.m. And the report breaks down the information so each of the local operations offices can see what the risk is for their respective area or or the region that they're Mm -hmm. currently operating in. And this allows the local area supervisors to share this information with their line crews and their servicemen um, during their morning tailgate meetings. And it allows us to make uh, decisions jointly right away in the morning between the control center and the local offices. So we're all looking at the same data, the same um, source of information, and we can make these decisions then um, together instead of independently 
So the risk information is auto automatically sent to all of our local offices. Um, and again, we're all looking at this information at the same time. So if there's questions about the forecasts or, you know, the rationale behind the risk level, you know, as Rennie mentioned earlier, you know, I, I've received questions on this in the past and I shoot it mm -hmm. out to DTN's fire weather meteorologists and they get a response back right away. So we have a better understanding of what the rationale is behind a high risk or a low risk. In the future, you know, we're even looking at a process to upload the risk information directly into our SCADA system and display it maybe as a banner or something like that. So when we're working outages or performing switching actions, you know, we can be mindful of changes in fire weather risk, you know, as we're making real-time decisions because it'll be right there displayed in front of us uh, for both us here in the operations uh, control center as well as the guys out in the field. Very good. Denton, how is having a risk planning index established in advance and receiving regular real-time fire weather data help Black Hills Energy to manage the increasing risk of wildfires? You know, one of the ways is, you know, previously I mentioned this is shared with the local area operations offices and the frontline employees during morning tailgates. And what this approach does um, it, from my perspective, is it helps create a culture where we're always being mindful of wildfire risk and, and mitigating actions, no different mm -hmm. than trying to create a, a, you know, an effective safety culture within your organization. So during a high-risk fire day, you know, we may reschedule a job that involves driving through a grassy field uh, to a day when there's lower risk. Uh, if it's work we have to perform, we can also take additional measures to have fire extinguish, extinguishing equipment on site, or even go so far as to having a dedicated fire watch out there while the crew is performing, you know, if it's hot work or something to that effect. Sure. Okay. How do you use the data intelligence you receive to effectively predict and respond to the spread of actual wildfires on the ground? You know, I, I don't know if I'd say we're to the point yet where we're predicting wildfire spread characteristics, uh, but mm -hmm. we have a lot more insight into the conditions that promote large wildfire growth. What this has done is it's allowed our teams to be more prepared for an interagency type of response. You know, if we know there's a very high potential for wildfires or wildfire spread that day, we're much more prepared to coordinate and assist the emergency responders with power shutoffs or rerouting power. So we're reducing that element of surprise, so we're able to plan for additional resources, change the way that we work under high fire conditions, and react more quickly in real time to support the, and assist the emergency responders. Do you have any practical tips for other electrical utilities about using fire weather forecasting and establishing their own risk planning index? Well, I think the risk is different for every utility and can vary greatly depending on, uh, you know, upon the makeup of their service territory. So I think you have to determine what the risk level the electric utility is comfortable with. Mm -hmm. I'll say our, our approach has changed as we become more educated on fire risk. You know, our number one priority uh, 10 years ago or really since you know, I started in the electric utility, electric utility industry was always to keep the lights on, right? Reliability was always number one. And now we have to balance that reliability with our customer risk and our utility risk. And if the conditions exist, you know, we may have to shut off power to customers to protect their life, property, and equipment now. Sure. So, Initially, getting that buy-in can be tough. I think the first step is getting buy-in from everybody that is going to be involved and impacted and really, you know, start that education process and learning more about it. Another important factor is wildfire preparedness or readiness has to be easy, almost automated, I would say, so it can become part of your culture. Uh, if you develop an elaborate plan and can't follow through with it because you're dependent upon you know, a single individual or a certain team on a weekend or after hours, it's much less likely to be successful. So that's something that was a very high priority for me and that I 
I worked hard with DTN to help develop that automated email that gets generated every morning. We know when it's going to be there, and we know how to react when we receive it. So we placed all those analytics with DTN and the fire weather experts. Once we receive that risk forecast, we've got our 24-7 reliability center staff that can act on that risk level any day of the year. So it's very easy for us to act on these changing risk levels, and it doesn't rely on management approval or anybody else to be executed. Thank you very much, Denton. Rene, I have a, a last question for you. Where can our listeners get more information about DTN and the services you provide? Yeah, the best place to do so is our website, which is uh, dtn.com. Uh, but we're also active on social media, uh, such as LinkedIn, Twitter, uh, Facebook, and are constantly providing information on our products and services, but also really interesting use cases such as the ones we've explored today. And and DTN is focused, uh, as I mentioned from the outset, on taking weather information and, and really driving value to organizations where a, a weather risk presents challenges to uh, the organization in various different ways. So uh, again, me- best place is dtn.com, but if uh, you're really active on social media, you can find us there as well. Rene and Denton, thank you both very much for sharing your knowledge, experiences, and insights into the topic of fire weather forecasting and the related tools available to electrical utilities in this episode of Energy Talks. Thanks for the invite. It's been an honor to spend time uh, with both of you today. Yep. Thanks, Scott. Rennie, I appreciate you uh, taking the time to talk more about wildfire. It was great to have you both here for this discussion. And a big thank you to our audience for listening to this episode of Energy Talks. We always welcome your questions and feedback. Simply send us an email to podcast at omicronenergy.com. You can also be an expert guest on Energy Talks. If you have a power system testing or related power industry topic you think would be of interest for us to discuss in this podcast series, please let us know. Omicron has several years of experience in power system testing and offers you the matching solution for your application. For more information, be sure to visit our website at omicronenergy.com. Please join us to listen to the next episode of Energy Talks. Goodbye for now, everyone.